Well, stand up, church. Greet those people around you. We're about to get started this morning. Well, praise God, church. I'm glad y'all are here. I'm glad everybody's tuned in. So come on in, find somebody to sit by, give them a handshake and a welcome and tell them you're glad to see them. Matter of fact, just turn around to that person behind you and say, you know, you're looking good today. You're looking good. It's going to be good church today. It's going to be good church. Well, praise God. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's get started. Heavenly Father, we just praise you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that we can gather, we can come together. Lord, whether it's uh, no matter where we are in the world, Lord God, we can connect ourselves in the spirit and worship you. And so, Lord, I give you all the praise this morning. I thank you for it. I thank you, Jesus. You're so good to us. Lord, you made a way where there wasn't any way, but you did it. And we praise you for it. We're going to celebrate this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
blood of Jesus His righteousness is like a robe upon you clothing and covering His garment of praise will now adorn you and you'll live Royalty has finally found a home in you. Praise Him. Lift your hands and praise Him.
Well, Lord, there is no treasure as great as you. And we praise you that you've come into our life. That you called us, Lord. You reached out. You plucked us up out of the mire and the muck of life. And Lord, we stand here today and we worship you. We worship you, Lord, with all of our heart. Now, church, just make this a house of prayer. People you know today that are hurting, people you know that are sick, people you know that, that need help, just begin to talk to the Lord about it right now. Lift them up to Him. Father, we just pray for people. Those that are lost and undone in life. Lord, those that are depressed and discouraged and fearful. We just lift them up to you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, no matter where they are, we just ask you to touch them by your spirit right now. Let them feel your love. Let them feel your grace. Lord, those that are sick in body and fighting in their bodies, Lord, God, I just pray over them. That they'd be healed in Jesus' name. Restore their health, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, those that need guidance in life. Need wisdom. Just pray for them, Lord. Now come on, reach over to that person beside you and pray for them. Bless that one on your left and right this morning. Father, we just pray over that person on our left and our right today. Lord, whatever they have need of, whatever's going on in life, Lord, give them a fresh word from you today. Let them hear from heaven like they never heard before. Lord, just bless them exceedingly, abundantly, beyond they could even think or ask. Let them, know, let them know how much you love them, Lord. And Lord, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Now look at that person around you and say, man, I'm glad to see you today. Come on, look at somebody else around, around you there and say, boy, you're looking good. Glad you're here. Good morning. Happy first Sunday. Glory to glory, glory. March. Spring is there. I felt it Tuesday and then boom. Summer, winter, summer, winter. I just like a spring. We just like, let's just ease into spring, right? Wow. Well, good morning. If you need an offering, I'm going to raise your hand or Eshes will get you one. This is our first Sunday family fellowship day. So if you hear of the children, you're just going to put a big smile on your face when you hear chatter or whatever. We're celebrating with our families this morning and going to take communion at the end together as a family. We have travel units in the back. If you're not able to or not comfortable coming to the front to take communion this morning, we have travel packs at the back of the doors. You can help yourself to those. And also, if you want to take communion to someone, feel free to take some and uh, take communion with somebody uh, that might be in their home this morning and uh, be in agreement with that precious covenant that Jesus did with us because of that. Let me get through these announcements really quick. La, 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 la. Let's see here. 
Oh, I have a special out, outside of the church announcement for a children's, uh, the Baptist Church here in Utopia is starting a children's choir starting Mondays at 5.30 to 6.15 for pre-K through 6th grade. They're going to learn how to make a joyful noise, amen? It's good to start them off early in their age to, to worship the Lord, amen? So they're going to start that Baptist, the Baptist Church here in Utopia, 5.30, 6.15. If you want more information... Leslie, stand up. She's got some cards that can um, give you a little more information on the person to contact. But I'm sure if you show up at the Baptist Church with your kiddos at 5:30, they're going to be you're good to go. Uh, this Thursday, uh, six o'clock, our fast class. Kara, where are you? I can't see you. Stand up, Kara, just for a second. Uh, she's going to be teaching uncovering the spiritual root of disease. It's going to be deep. Woo, go girl. I'm going to be praying for you this week because that's. <laughs> Um, this coming Saturday, there's not going to be any youth, um, and Brother Ivan's coming. <laughs> Woo! He's going to be here Sunday, most likely Sunday morning, Sunday night, so we'll be meeting, he'll be here, and you're going to be filled to overflowing with all of that. Um, the scripture uh, this week, I've been uh, praying for you and about what I shared last week about forgiveness, and the Lord says, I, I want you to share that again. I'm like, Lord, they're going to think I didn't prepare for the offering. He's like, I want you to share that again. And, I, and he showed me a picture of someone that was um, literally in handcuffs. They were handcuffed in front like this, and their head was down. And um, let me read this scripture to you, and, it'll, and it will completely make sense to you. <clears throat> so this is not, this is Jesus' words, okay? I'm just the carrier. So don't be mad at me. Uh, so... Luke 6, 37, Jesus said, everybody say, Jesus said. Forsake the habit of criticizing and judging others, and you will not be criticized and judged in return. Pause and calmly think about that. Don't condemn others, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, everybody say forgive, over and over and over. You remember when Peter asked Jesus, like, how many times do I have to forgive? Like, seven times? He's like, Jesus said, 70 times 70. He's like, that's a day. How many times do we have opportunities to forgive in a day, right? It's a daily operation. So that's, the, that's what Jesus says. Then he says, give generously, and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of your generosity becomes the measurement of your return. So this morning is a perfect opportunity that if, you're, if you have unforgiveness or if you just know there's just like a little something in there, today is a perfect opportunity when we take communion to bring that and let it go. Amen? Because when you let it go, then God can let it flow in your life. And the thing that happened with me is I was totally justified in holding some unforgiveness against somebody, and I realized it was only hurting me. And forgiveness is the gift that you give yourself. And the song that we sang this morning, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought. Forgiveness was already bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So when we worship the Lord this morning with our tithes and offerings, just when you come to the altar this morning, just release it and let it go. And those handcuffs, whoever it is, I don't know, it may, it's probably not any of you in here. It could be somebody out there. Somebody's going to be watching down the road. Who doesn't know? I don't know. But those hand, it's just like when you let it go, those handcuffs just fall off and your hands are able to lift and raise. When you let it go, God's going to let it flow. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come in this place and worship you. We worship you now with our tithes and offerings, and we're so grateful, Jesus, for the precious blood that you poured out for us, for forgiveness. You said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And so we just thank you for that cleansing power of your blood. I thank you for the offering as it goes forth, that it's blessed, that you increase it, and that it comes back to them um, exceedingly abundantly, what anyone can ask, think, or imagine. I thank you that you prepare our hearts right now to receive the word that's going to go forth, Lord, and that we remember you as we take of the communion this morning, and we remember all that you did for us, and we receive it, and we go out and, and, and take it into the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
taking up the offering. I have this little short, short, short word. I shared it with my prayer people on either side, but I think it was for me, but maybe someone else. And the word was this, and praise the Lord. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. As you enter into my presence in this day of worship on the Sabbath, I'll restore everything the canker worm has stolen from you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Well, by faith, grab it. Sure's. Um, get your Bibles out. Woo! Turn to Luke chapter 6. Tracy's going to go back and preach that again, but I might as well too. No, I, I started this message. I thought I'd finish it last week, and I kind of did, but I hurried. And I don't feel like we're through with Luke chapter 6, and I want to go back and look at some things. The title of this message was Divide and Conquer, and it's what the spirit of division wants to do in the world today. You know, you got to understand something. It's, it's like I, I shared with you last week that, <clears throat> you know, there's this thing in your brain, it's called a reticular activator, and it's this part of your brain that the, it's, it's when you, you buy a you know, I don't know, you buy a gray car and you think nobody has the same color of gray car as I have. And then you drive that car down the road for the first time and you just start noticing other ones and other ones. You never saw them before. It's that thing in your brain that when you, when you, you know, get honed in on something, then you begin to recognize it and see it everywhere. And we need to understand that what's going on in the world today, it's a spirit of division. The devil wants to divide you. He wants to divide you and conquer you. That's what Jesus said he does. That's what he's best at. He's best at killing, stealing, and destroying. So whenever there's conflict comes in your life, you need to stop, whether it's you know between your, 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 your boss, your spouse, your children. You need to stop and realize right then that what's happening is the enemy is wanting to come into your life, and he's wanting to conquer you and he's going to try to do it by bringing division because you are stronger in life by having people around you who love you than you are standing as an island as a one person show as a statue you know I mean uh, you're just not going to make it and so the devil wants to divide and conquer us he's trying to do it uh, throughout our, our country he's trying to do it everywhere so what he wants to do amen so then we looked at how do you keep from getting divided how do you keep from allowing this spirit to come into your life because i'm going to tell you something once you've allowed uh, a divisive spirit to work in your life well then it'll keep working and then it's going to be other people and other people and more things and more things that you become division in your life hello amen you know what i'm talking about know where i'm coming from yeah come on y'all y'all gotta help me here now so anyway uh, we, we looked at all this stuff about how the plots of the enemy is, what he wants to do. God wants us to walk in love, uh, but our job is to stand fast and not allow this, this spirit to work. And so anyway, I want to pick it up in Luke chapter 6. Let me get down here. So then we talked about that, that also last week we talked about the Beatitudes when uh, Jesus was telling us how to keep this divisive spirit out of our life, right? And so, you know, the first one was is that we need, it's this, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. But it didn't mean you're poor, poor. It meant that you're in a needy place. You're always needing God to help you and deliver you. That's a good place to be. Yeah, and the second one was, you know, it says the, those that are hungry, to stay hungry for Jesus. You know, I, I saw this little little reel the other day where a guy was going up to people at a gas station says I'll pay for your gas you know they were pumping already he said I'll pay for your gas if you uh, can give me one bible verse and people just were like oh no go ahead go away oh no go away and I thought man boy hit me up filling up my old Dodge diesel truck out there bless God I'm jumping on that thing you know it's a hundred bucks just to even look at it and but people wouldn't even talk to him. People wouldn't even attempt to do anything, you know. And uh, I thought, man, those people sure aren't hungry for the word of God to know what God has to say. But anyway, we have to stay hungry. The third one was that it says, 
um, a, a broken spirit. Well, we're talking about being grieved for the things we see in the world. You know, it doesn't do any good to complain about it. It doesn't do any good to, to point fingers at it and, you know, bring out the error. What does good is for you to be grieved about what's going on and pray for it. Can I have an amen? And then the, the, the fourth one was, is don't think it's strange when the world hates you. This is persecution. Jesus said, man, we get our, we were persecuted here on this earth, but we rejoice what's going to go on in heaven. Amen? So anyway, so then I want you to look at uh, verse 46. I'm in Luke 7, 46. <clears throat> so Jesus has said all this. He's done all of this. He's talked about the Beatitudes. He's talked about all this stuff. And then he, he finishes the chapter with this. He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things in which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears these sayings and does them, I will show you who he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and he laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the, the stream beat vehemently against that house, and could not shake it, for it was foundation, or it was, found, it was founded on the rock. But when he heard these things, but he who heard these things and did not do them is like the man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the streams beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Okay, so Jesus goes back and he he he, he ends this chapter by saying. Basically, you got to have a good foundation in life. Hello? Okay, now I'm going to come back to that in just a second. I want to read another scripture. Go to Mark chapter 4, verse 13, the parable of the sower. <clears throat> Mark 4, 13. He said, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. And these likewise are the ones sown on the stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterwards, when tribulation or persecution arise, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones that hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some hundredfold. You realize that when, when Jesus is talking about the scripture, the parable and the sower, that he's still talking about foundations. It's the foundation of where the seed's sown, right? And it's your heart. So he says here, if you build your house on the rock, and we, we, we look at this, but we've got to go a little more deeper this morning. Because you look and say, oh, yeah, I understand. You've got to have the foundation. But do you know what really goes into putting in a proper foundation in a house? Okay, if you, you know, I, I built homes, I built residential homes for years, and the foundation is everything. Hear what I'm saying? The foundation is everything. The first thing you got to do when you're going to put in a foundation, you're going to do it proper, you're going to do it right, you got to get a soil sample. You got to see what's in the soil. Is it going to have clay in it? Is it going to move? And then you send those soil samples to the engineer, and the engineer goes over and looks at the chemical makeup of the soil, and he goes through all, everything, everything from the, the, the acidic level of the soil to everything in there. He looks at it, he tells you, and then he tells me, he said, look, the soil is X. And in order to do that, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to dig out so many inches or so many feet. I did one home project, and, and, and the, the engineer told me, can the person build a house anywhere else? Can they buy, could they sell that land and buy a house, any, go anywhere else? Said, of all my days, I have never seen soil that bad. And I said, well, dude, that, you know, I mean, how severe? How, what do we got to do? And he says, to do it properly, you're going to have to excavate 
six foot deep, dirt all the way out, and four foot wider than the foundation of the house. And you're going to have to fill it all up with good base. That's how bad the soil was. And I was like, I've never heard anything that extreme. He said, I've never seen anything this extreme. So my point is, the foundation is everything, but then when you go in and you have to, you have to excavate each other to do whatever you got to do, you got to compact the soil. Every eight inches, six to eight inches, you put it in there, you compact the soil, you water, it's got to be at the right moisture level that, 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 that it can compact to the best, and you pound it in there, and you roll it, and you do everything you can, and you keep bringing it up in lifts until you get it to where now you're ready to start building. Think about how much preparation has to go and take place before you could ever even begin to think about pouring concrete. Hello? But so many times Christians in our life, we just, you know, we, we get saved, we make Jesus, we, we make him the savior of our life. We say, Jesus, I believe in you. And then we just go get any kind of dirt we want to to build our foundation. Take a little from this preacher. Take a little from that church. Take a little from this denomination. Let your whatever, remember old great grandma, she used to say this and put that in there and just mix all this stuff up and mix it all up in there and then think that your foundation is going to stand. Woo! I cannot tell you how many times in my life of, of over 40 years of serving the Lord that the Holy Ghost would tap on the door of my heart and say, that's not right. And I'd say, what? I've always believed that. You mean it's not? No, it's not. That's not the way it goes. I'll tell you one. one I, 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 I read in my early days the story of uh, the woman who was trying to get Jesus to cast, the Shunammite woman, get to cast the devil out of her, her daughter. And Jesus wasn't paying any attention because she wasn't Jewish. And finally, she said, he says, you know, where I'm, I'm given to the, to, the, to the house of Israel, not in, to the dogs. And she says, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat from under the table. And Jesus said, man, you got a good point. And he healed her daughter, okay? And I saw that, and I said, hey, well, wait a minute here, Lord. I see what you're saying. I, I, Lord, I'm just going to believe you that you can, uh, you can get me. And I was working, I was building, I was doing everything, and, 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 and I said, you can get me around some wealthy people. It's got a lot of money, and, you know, stuff's always going to fall off the table. And I'll take the scraps that fall on the table because that, you know, is going to be a lot. And I started praying and thinking like this, and one day the Lord rebuked me. He said, let me tell you something. He said, I didn't call you as a child of God to eat off the floor. You're a child of God. You're supposed to sit at the table and eat and believe me for the blessings of God coming in your life. Quit that thinking. That's poverty thinking. Stop it. And I was like, whoa. I mean, it was a thundering revelation to me. And I was like, yeah, see, I was just, I was thinking wrong, wrong foundation. That has to be excavated out. Hello? And re rebuilt back in. You don't know how many things in your life that there, maybe you have a weakness in your foundation. You don't know it until you get pressured. I mean, you can go out and, well, that's not true. If you walk outside and you look, there's a crack in the, Concrete that goes right out straight across over their heads from that fountain golf over there. There's no weight on that concrete. But when we poured it, we didn't do it right. It cracked. Ground moved because this ground around here has got a lot of clay in it. Right? But there's no weight on it. So see, you can pour a slab and you can think, oh, yeah, everything's going to be okay. Oh, I'm going to believe this. Everything's going to be okay, but you better wait because when the times come, when there's a lot of expansion and contraction in the soil, your, your foundation will break. And right now, there's a lot of expansion going on. There's a lot of movement of things going on of craziness, okay? Just outright craziness. And that the whole, the whole United States is, is, is just in the throes of just like the ground expanding and contracting and those foundations that aren't strong foundations are going to get cracks in them. Now surface cracks don't really matter. Little ones. Right? 
They don't really matter. They're just, they're just a surface crack. You're going to go ahead and put tile down on the floor or whatever. You're going to cover it up. Nobody's going to ever notice it. Okay? It's not, a, it's not a crack that goes all the way through. It's just a surface crack. All right? And so, but listen to this. After the foundation's in, after everything's done, do you know that, that one of the things that is really big is I have to stress to the homeowners that they have to still take care of their house? Because you, you can't let it erode. There's got to be a, a slope that comes off the foundation that runs down, not drastic, but enough slope that water will drain away. But you've got to have enough moisture in the soil to keep the foundation secure. In other words, it's a continual maintenance. It's not like you got it built and it's all over with. And you never have to think about it anymore. So, oh, the house is done. It's all through. No, you got to keep the grass watered. Because what's going to happen? Soil gets dry, starts to expand, contract, gets cracks in it. It'll cause your foundation to crack. And then a person says, well, it's your fault. You built the house that didn't do good. And I said, no, it's your fault. You didn't take care of it. Everybody wants to blame the preacher. But there's a responsibility on your end to take care of the foundation of your life. And if you look, if you walk outside and you notice that your foundation is eroding, but you don't do anything about it, you notice that water's running where it shouldn't be and you don't do anything about it, and you notice there's some erosion in the foundation, and you say, ah, it'd be okay. Yeah, it'd be okay. Oh, but you better wait because then you better watch it because then when something comes that's stressful upon the foundation of your life, that part can crack, right? So Jesus is trying to, to, to tell us and to show us, I mean, we gotta have a, you got to have a good foundation, all right? Now, I'm going to give you three points to a good foundation. I like to make things simple. Because, see, I don't want to just tell you you may have foundation problems and say, okay, well, let's have communion and go home. I want to tell you what you can do to help fix your foundation. So, Find the Old Testament script, Old Testament book of Haggai. H A G G A I. Haggai. You may not, if you're not familiar with the Bible, you may have to go look at the index in the front, and I don't care. But I want you to find this. I want you to see something. Haggai was a prophet. You got to understand that, that Israel had been conquered. They had been carried away to Babylon for 70 years. They had been there. Then Cyrus, the king of Assyria there, rose up. God spoke to him. He was not a, a godly king. God spoke to him, though, and told him to send the Israelites back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So Ezra took the first bunch back. He went back to, to Jerusalem. They went in there, immediately caught all kinds of flack from all the people that were around them and building it. But they're trying to work and they're trying to build. And Haggai was a prophet that came about in those years, all right? And so Haggai begins to look at what's going on, and what happened was 16 years, 16 years after the Israelites had gone back to Jerusalem, the temple still hadn't gotten built. They weren't working on it. And so this is what Haggai says to him. I'm in chapter 1, verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you aren't filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. For thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So what had happened is all the Israelites had gone back. They all were excited. We're going to rebuild the temple. We're going to do this. Oh, they were so excited. And they got going. And then, you know, it didn't take them very long. They said, hey, you know, <clears throat> I'd like to take off some time and go over there, you know, and, and work on my house and my stuff. And. And then everybody got to doing that, and then everybody got to doing it so much, no work was getting done. 
So Haggai says, hey, the word from the Lord was consider your ways. He says, look, you have to look at yourself in your life and say, is it good? Now, what's funny about that is, you know, to a good old country boy, a good life is a little bit different than maybe what somebody else may have been raised. Hello? Look at the person beside you and say, I know what he's talking about. I don't have a lot of needs. I don't have a lot of wants. All right? I really don't. If I got one pair of shoe boots that fit good, I'm happy. I used to say boots, but now I'm having to start wearing some shoe boots. Not she boots, but shoe boots. You can only wear one shirt at a time. I mean, you know. My point being, <clears throat> these people had quit working on the, the house of God because they were trying to make their life better. All right? And God says, consider your ways. Consider what you're doing. In other words, make me first. All right? So how do you know if you've made God first? I was asking the Holy Ghost this. I said, well, you know, what's a good example? And this popped in my head. Okay. I, when, when, when I'm going to make a decision to do something that I'm wanting counsel, the first person I go to is my wife. Okay. Ask her. But wouldn't it be really weird if I called you on the phone and I said, hey, I need to talk to your wife. They said, well, what's your wife? I said, well, my wife hadn't said anything yet. I just want to talk to your wife before I talk to mine. <laughs> Y'all said, that's weird, Robert. What's the matter with you? You should talk to your wife first, right? Okay, well, if you want to know if God's first, then this is it. Is he the first one you turn to? Then you would know, is God first in your life? Your truck won't start is the first thing you think about is praying, oh, God, my truck won't start. Help me here. You follow me? Or is first in your life, you know, you just get mad, throw a fit. Just kick and cuss and spit flying. Get out and talk about how stupid your truck is, how bad your life is. Well, then God's not first. That problem is first in your life. The problem is magnified greater than God because that's what you're going to first. This is how you find out if God's first in your life and where God is first in your life. You wake up one morning and you're discouraged. What do you turn to? Is the first thing you turn to God? Turn to the Word? Turn to counsel of your godly friends? Or is it just, you know, whatever, drugs, shot of whiskey, four fingers of tequila? I've only ever heard about that kind of stuff. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> thought somebody out here might know. Probably somebody viewing. Are you following what I'm saying here? Folks, listen to me. If you, if you, worry, and you're anxious, okay, then I can tell you you're not going to God first. You're going to worry first. You're going to what if first. And so then that is the God of your life. It's worry. Y'all with me here? Okay. Psalm 16, 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. That was David's stance. I've set the Lord before me. He's at my right hand, so I'm not going to be moved. 
He's first. So just ask yourself the simple question, who's first? Is God first? Worry first? Who's first? Okay? So the second thing that you're going to do so that you build a solid foundation within your life, all right, is family. The whole reason we have such a breakdown in our society today is because there is no family values anymore. That's why when, you know, we try to do things here with the kids, we try to do things with the kids and the family, we got folks, I can't emphasize how much, even if your kids gripe and complain about coming to church, this is important to get them in church so they build a habit of coming to church. My parents, God bless them, took me to church all the time. I wasn't listening, wouldn't pay any attention. You wouldn't have thought, but it did have an effect on my life. And it developed me to finally get to the place where God could speak to me in my own life. Are you with me? It's important. And people today have no, have no family values, family morals, families that they were just were going to raise their kids. Hello? Now, Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. When Jesus, or the angel, and uh, was coming down to talk to Abraham about destroying Sodom, he says in verse 17, this he says about Abraham. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Think about this. God chose Abraham because Abraham was a man that was going to teach his children. How important family is to have godly values in your family. Husbands, how important it is to you to be a man of God for your children. I should have got a better amen out of you guys. <clears throat> to be able to, 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 be able to, to, to guide your children, guide your family by your morals and your integrity. That's gone today. Today it's do whatever you feel like doing. What I don't understand about that is what if I just feel like beating that person up? Uh, They get to do what they feel like. Why can't I do what I feel like? You say, well, that's not right. I said, no, I think they're just so entitled they don't think that that could possibly happen. And so the world's operating on this is what I feel like doing. What I feel like doing makes me happy. This is what I need to do. No, no, no. We have a foundation in our life. Our foundation is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. We're going to do what Jesus has told us to do because that's what is our foundation is built on. And we're not going to move off of it. And we're going to speak and raise our families and teach them the ways of God. And I just can't understand how, I mean, well, see, this is me. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm saying this wrong. When I say I can't understand, because my mind gets blown when I see people that want to put horrible books in, into our school and teach things that are wrong. And then if we say anything about it, or bring a Bible in, it's like you've brought Satan's holy material in there. It's going to burn the whole library down. And I'm like, it's a Bible. Why are y'all so scared of it? But put anything else up, you can do that because that's what makes you feel good. And the reason why they don't want to see this book is because this book tells them that what they're doing is wrong. And then they don't want anybody to tell them that what they're doing is wrong. 
Hello? So family is so important. Today we have to realize how important family is. It's a second foundation stone of what we're building our whole life on is our family and our children. So then as our kids get older, hello, when our kids get older and all, you still got to be patterned, you still got to be, be, be nurturing, you still got to be helping water their foundation, helping, look, all right, there's some erosion going on over here. You still got to be doing that because God called us to be family people. In Acts 16, 25, when Paul and Silas were in prison <clears throat> and had been thrown in prison and they were down there singing, remember, and the earthquake came and shook the whole place and the doors fly open and the guard think, looks down there, sees all the doors open, thinks he's lost all the prisoners, he's going to kill himself, and Paul hollers at him and said, don't kill yourself, right? Y'all remember that? Okay, it's right there in those verses. And then he, he says, he, then he called for them in, in, in a light, and he ran down, and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas, and they brought them out, and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Because he knew, hey, wait a minute, there's something, there's something happening here that's right. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, you and your household. God cares about your households. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to them, and they all who were in the and to, <laughs> then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house, and he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when they had brought them to the out into the house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Don't write a kid off. Are you hearing me? Don't say, well, you know, we did pretty good. We, we batting 50%. No. Don't do that. Stand and fight. Believe and speak over your family. Fathers, you should be speaking over your family every day. You should be pleading the blood of Jesus over your family every day. Doesn't make any difference how old they are, how long you know you've had to do this. It's not time. You don't get to get to the place where you can just turn around and say, Well, I'm too old, can't do it. Can't remember their names. Well, write them down on a list or have somebody else do them. Just call them out. Say, so. Praying for John, I, I don't even know who he is, but bless John, just whatever. Go down the list, it don't make no difference. It's still your responsibility as heads of your households, as a, as a father, to speak and to pray and to believe God for blessings over your family and blessings over your children and blessings over everything that they're going to put their hands to. It's our responsibility, it's part of your foundation maintenance. And you can't get off and say, well, you know, it's just a little eroded. That corner breaks off. It's no big deal. Mm -mm. So it brings me to the last one, the third one here. So after you, you know, are laying this foundation, you've put God first, you got your family going, then, then comes whatever you're doing in the world or how you're influencing the world. I don't know how many men I've talked to in life that have built their businesses, built an empire, and lost their family. It's wrong. Hello? You cannot build an empire at the cost of your family and think you're successful. You say, well, it takes hard work. It does. Nobody said being a Christian is easy. I remember used to be, we had a lumber company right here in town. And a lot of the old timers, which now I'm realizing those old timers weren't that, they were about my age down there, the old timers. But I was young then, and I'd always just love to go sit in there and listen to their stories and talk to them. And then as they got older in life, they'd, they, they, each one started walking with a cane, and then they had their canes, and I would be all, I'd tease them, and I'd say, man, I can't wait till I get to walk with a cane, man, you can, 
you know, do anything you want to with it. Poke people, you know, and drag stuff over. And, and you know, somebody wants to give you a hard time, use it to just whack them over the head. And they said, yeah, but the problem is, is when you get to be our age, they may take it away from you and whack you over the head. And I would tease these guys, and I'm talking about getting older. And I remember one day they said, just wait. Your day's coming. And now I realize that they were right. As I've gotten older, it's easy to be older and turn around and look back and think, man, what did I do? Why didn't I spend more time doing this or more time doing that? And why was I worried about this and worried about that? And to look backwards and to realize I lived through it all. Now, I want y'all to understand something. I've had faith in Jesus, you know, since I got saved. Forty years just walking, serving the Lord with all of my heart. But I'm going to tell you something. It hadn't been easy, but I lived through it all. I'm still alive and kicking. I'm still a threat to hell. Right? I may not move as fast and not, you know, quite as good a shape as I used to be. But, you know, bless God. I'm still going forward. Still got breath in my lungs. I'm still praising God. And the things that I worried about looking back, they weren't worth worrying about. They were not worth getting in an argument with my wife over. They weren't. And I'm just saying to you younger people in here today, and listen to me, set God first, set your family first, and then start dealing with your influence in the world. Whatever your influence is. Whether you're a welder or a well driller or a you know, carpenter or, or business or entrepreneur, whatever, whatever it is, let that come after you've got your foundation set, God is first, you're ministering to your family and loving your family, and then that becomes third. Man, I thought you all right now just be like, rejoicing and throwing, shooting off ribbons, shooting your gun up in the air or something, you know? It's kind of like sports. I worked so hard to play sports when I was in high school. And then now all I do is try to go to the doctor to nurse what happened to me when I was playing sports. As my wounds, you know, my foot, my foot hurts, you know, I has what I'm going to do. And I'm like, oh, what, was that? what was that for? Why didn't somebody say, yes, okay, you can do these sports, but then know that when you're 60s, you're going to be dealing with this. I'd have probably still done it, but you follow what I'm saying? At least I'd have had somebody give me some forewarning. And that's what I'm trying to do to you this morning. It's just like I feel this message burning in my heart because I'm just saying, look, you let your influence on the world come after. You've got God first and your family first. Now, scriptures, James 4.13. James 4.13. It says, Come now, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? Is it, is it even a, it's a, it's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. If you knew to do right and you didn't do it, then it's sin. So sometimes I've prayed because I'll, I'll go home after church on a Sunday and thought, well, Lord, I sure hope, I pray, that I didn't just cause everybody to be a bigger sinner. Because now I told them some truth, and if they don't do it, and they knew to do it, I just caused them to be bigger sinners. 
But that's not y'all. Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, Jerusalem was the town. Samaria was the, I mean, Judea was the area, and Samaria was a larger area. Be like saying Utopia, Texas, and the United States. In other words, you start building at home, you influence at home. Then you stretch it out, and then you stretch it out if so be. Amen? We start at home and then expand. Now, this is a foundation I told you about this morning, these three simple things that I guarantee won't fall, won't fall no matter what comes. Hello? No matter what comes. So, we've got communion today. And so, what I'm, what I'm challenging you about this morning is simply when you come to the altar this morning and you receive communion, ask yourself those questions. Is God first? But what am I doing about family? What am I doing about my influence in the world? See if those three are in order. All right? See if those three are in order. If they're not, well, then you got an opportunity right here to repent and get them straight. Because that's what's going to give you that foundation in life that, man, it won't be shaken. Amen? Amen. So you start searching your heart. Can I have my prayer team? Pastoral team, whoever's coming down here to help me this morning. For those of you watching, if you've uh, got your communion elements there at your house ready, once you know here at Living Waters Church you have an open communion service, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're more than welcome to have communion with us this morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're in here today or if you're out there watching and you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven, well, the Bible's real simple. It says if you'd confess with your mouth and you'd believe in your heart and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, well, that he would, you would be saved. Your sins would be forgiven. You'd be made right with God. Jesus is the answer. So right there in your home, you can cry out and pray and say, Jesus, come into my life. I want you to be the, my Lord and Savior. If you're here and you're not sure, we've got prayer team people up here. And so when you come up, just step up there and tell one of them, hey, would you pray with me? And just watch the miracle God does for you. Amen? And so the Bible tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he took bread. And he broke it and gave it to his disciples and he said, now take and eat. For this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Lord, we thank you that you went to the cross for us. You gave your life for us, but your body was broken for us. So that by the stripes of Jesus, we could be healed. And so Lord, I thank you for healing people today. I believe you for miracles, Lord God, touching people, everybody just even watching as they take communion today. For healing bodies, broken bodies, broken spirits, broken hearts. Healing people today, Lord God, because of what you did for us on that cross. Thank you. Then afterwards you took the cup. And you said, this cup is a new covenant poured out in my body for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, I thank you for this amazing covenant that, Lord, we can be forgiven of our sins and made right in the eyes of Almighty God. Lord, you said, be perfect as I'm perfect, and this is the only way for us to be perfect is to keep ourselves under the blood covenant of Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you for it, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' mighty name.
Okay, church, come on. Receive from the Lord what you have need of today.
Praise God, church. Stand up with me, if you would. Father, I just declare today that these are the most blessed people on the face of the earth. Lord, I thank you that the good hand of God is upon them. And that when we walk in this world, Lord God, we walk because of a strong foundation within our life. That you are the first in our life. And Lord God, we declare today that you're going to continue to guide us and lead us and direct us. I ask you to, as, as we go forth, Lord, to give us people to run across our path, that we can tell them the good news about Jesus. And so, Lord, we just give you all the praise today. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you, church. We still got our prayer people up here if you need prayer. God bless you and go get them. <laughs>